And um, before we begin, I just would like to introduce WBN for any visitors that we may have and just to remind ourselves who we are, okay? So the Women on Boards Network is an initiative aimed at promoting and encouraging women into the board leadership. The network provides a platform that will bring together women from diverse fields and ranks, facilitate those already sitting on boards to effectively carry out their roles and responsibilities and upskill and prepare for the boardroom those women who are already in senior leadership roles, sorry, but are not yet sitting on any boards. So the initiative is aimed, is all about ensuring that the next generation of board members is more diverse and better balanced from a gender perspective. So welcome again. My name is Sharon Michina, your moderator. And um, now I'd like to introduce our speaker for the evening. Her name is Nuru Mugambi, and she is going to be giving us a talk on positioning masterclass. Now, uh, Nuru cautioned me and she said I should just give a very brief introduction. Um, but of course, I'm not going to do that because that would not do her any justice. And uh, I just want us to really appreciate who we have before us this evening. Okay, so Nuru is a, Nuru Mugambi is a seasoned financial sector policy professional with expertise in sustainable finance and is one of the preeminent green finance policy leaders in Africa. It's a very new field and she's one of the leaders in it. Her passion is in financial inclusion for persons with disabilities and women's economic empowerment. Nuru is an Eisenhower Fellow and is the Kenya Chairperson for New Faces, New Voices, a Gracka Michelle Trust, and she's also a top 40 under 40 winner. Her current roles, I'm just gonna mention three of the big roles that I feel are really pertain to her talk tonight and they really highlight who she is. Uh, Nuru Mugambi is uh, an advisor for a venture capitalist fund out of uh, California. And this fund is ATSIA, it's a global organization that invests, advises, and partners to level the investment playing field from a gender perspective. She's also the chairperson for the Angaza Awards. And this Angaza Awards were founded in 2020, and they celebrate the top 10 women to watch in banking and finance across Africa. The goal is to build and empower a network of impactful and purposeful driven women in finance who are committed to Africa's sustainable economic development. Thirdly, she's a SUID Program Steering Committee member. SUID is a, um, a DFID, a UK fund. It's about Kenya shillings, 9 billion. And the fund aims at supporting 10 counties in Kenya to establish sustainable infrastructure and value chain projects aligned with the sustainable development goals. And in addition to all of this, Nu is pursuing her graduate studies at the Andrew Young School of Policy at Georgia State University. And by the way, this is her second MBA. And her area of study, as you guessed it, is on sustainable finance, mainly green finance, she economy, and finance related to person with disabilities. Um, but Nuru's most important role is as mother to my beautiful, amazing niece, McKenna, just 15, and is studying to become an aerospace robotical engineer. So we are all in good hands. Welcome to my friend and my sister, Nuru Mugambi. Thank you so much, Sharon. You've gone above and beyond your call of duty as a sister and a moderator. I did want to get into the whole big story because uh, I know it's evening and I know people have had a long day. Um, so I wanted to get right into it. Um, but thank you so much, uh, uh, Mrs. Michner, for the, uh, the very articulate uh, introduction. Uh, I want to thank Nasarian and Ms. Catherine Musakali for the invitation to speak today. Um, it really is a pleasure. So uh, I believe I can be heard. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. And uh, Ms. Sharon, you'll tell me if you can see my slides. I can. Okay, great. Thank you. Fantastic. So welcome, everybody. I hope you've had a good day. Um, welcome to this positioning masterclass. Uh, I'm really honored uh, to give this talk. 
Uh, I've given this talk before and Catherine attended it. Catherine Sakali attended it and she asked me to come and give the same talk to you. Um, so it really is a pleasure. We're going to talk about um, and, and really think about how we can all be better about being sincere, being intentional and being consistent about our stories and how we position ourselves uh, within our industries and within our workplaces. I'd like you to take a minute to look at this photo and ask yourself, who are you? Who are you? Now, you're looking at an amazing woman and uh, she is part of the Mursi tribe in Omo Valley uh, in Ethiopia. And to me, this woman represents all of us. Women, we have so many layers. We are just so dynamic and we are powerful, we are strong. But sometimes I think we forget our power or we leave our power at home. And really we wanna think about that today. Um, this woman, she represents her culture. The Mursi tribe is one of the most indigenous tribes in Africa. It is said that Oro Valley is the birthplace of civilization, of, 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 of humanity, I should say. Um, you can see she's a mother. Um, she's holding uh, a Klashnikov, which is a which is a very powerful rifle that's used uh, in war. Uh, and the reason why she's holding that weapon is because in Omo Valley, this woman has to respond to her environment just the same way you've just spent your whole day responding to your environment. She has to deal with um, wildlife. There's a lot of human wildlife conflict. Uh, because of climate change, where she comes from, uh, she has to respond to warring tribes. It's a lot of uh, tribal disputes that she has to respond to. And of course, she has to protect her family. And uh, just like you, she occupies different spaces and have different roles. So when you ask her to give a TED talk about who she is, I'm sure she will give us a fantastic TED talk, but who are you? And this is what we're gonna think about today. And by the end of this session, I'm hoping that we will think about ourselves and our role as leaders and what our agenda is. We're gonna think about our scope, uh, not only from a role perspective, but geographically um, and from a sector perspective as a professional. We're gonna think about what we are saying versus what other people are hearing and seeing. Um, and we're gonna use Angaza Awards uh, as our, our uh, subject focus area based on that. And then finally, we're gonna talk about how to enhance our influence. And really, these are the four things that I'm hoping this session will help us uncover. Uh, we talked about it with Nasserian and Sharon earlier, and we feel that we want this to be a very interactive session. So please feel free to use the chat function. Please feel free to raise your hand. Um, Sharon will help me see if somebody has raised their hand because I can't see when the slides are projecting. So let's no get started. Thanks, Sharon. Let's get started. Um, what is the data telling us? And what is the data telling us about women at work? So I coined this term COVID Kairos because I believe that we have this window of opportunity, particularly as women and as particularly as African women. We have a window of opportunity to really leverage that inherent strength that we have. And uh, McKinsey did a very interesting study, a global study about the workplace and what people value in this COVID era uh, in terms of leaders and managers and what came out so strongly. And we've all heard about the great resignation. When people decided to quit their jobs in mass uh, to a point that it's a global phenomenon. When people decided to quit their jobs, they were quitting their bosses. They were quitting the work environments that they felt did not promote their well being. They were quitting the work environment that they felt that their leaders did not provide them a sense of appreciation of the dynamic layers that you have. You have work, but you also have life and you have goals outside of the office. And also the issue of emotional support, we know that mental health has really been uh, another uh, pandemic that we're really trying to deal with as the global community. And what we're finding is that as women, we're not appreciating the fact that the world needs more people like us in leadership. Career Connections did a very interesting piece of research um, across Africa, and, and I got some of this data with a training that I did at Career Connections. Um, and one of, and I'm sure many of you are career co your coaches or you've been coached and probably you've done 
um, the, the career connections assessment that they do, uh, or a Myers-Briggs assessment that really just looks at your personality and how you respond and how you show up at work. So Career Connections was looking at um, different indicators. One of the indicators was based on the HPI scale, which is the Hogan Personality Inventory. And what they found that, and I know these are many lines, and each of the different colors represents different um, sectors that you might be working with. So for example, the red line is people in finance who took the survey. The green line uh, is people in human resources. The orange line is people in sales. So each line represents a different um, function or sector that you could be working in. Now I've highlighted with this yellow um, circle, uh, I've highlighted with this yellow circle over, um, uh, over here. Oh, sorry. Uh, with this yellow circle over there, I've highlighted where it goes down. You can see where it dips and you can see the, the red line dips the most. And where it's dipping is two indicators, sociability and interpersonal sensitivity. Low interpersonal sensitivity is an indicator of how tactful somebody is, how socially sensitive somebody is, and how perceptive you are to other people's emotions. Now, remember what COVID Kairos is telling us. It's telling us that people care about managers and they want to be led by leaders who care, right? But unfortunately, professionals are leaving these skills at home when they come to the workplace. They're leaving the critical relationship building skills at home. Uh, and particularly when we look at the other side of it, there's the emotional aspect. Um, and sorry, I'm gonna go really quick. If you feel that I'm going too fast, you can just put up your hand and say, slow down Nuru and go back. Um, so when you look at when you look at um, those relationship building skills uh, that people value in the workplace, there is a view that we are not bringing our whole self. We're not bringing our whole self to the workplace, and we're not being sincere in terms of when we show up at work, who it is is that showing up. The other indicator that Career Connections found that I think is really interesting and it again speaks to the whole thing about positioning and how you position yourself as a leader in either your workplace or within your industry or pan-Africanly. What Career Connections found is a gap between women and men. The blue line is women, the orange line is men. Okay, and I'm gonna go from left to right. So you can see on the left, the indicator around power in terms of MVPI means your, your motives, your values, your perspectives. When it comes to the power motivation, men are outpacing women in the workplace. Men seek position of, le of leadership. Men position themselves as leaders, they demonstrate their power and that's how they're positioning themselves in the workplace. Men tend also to have a higher affiliation than women. That's the second indicator. You can see where it dips. You can see the blue line is dipping more than the orange line. The blue line is women again. So women are less, they tend less to be trying to build affiliation, a sense of interaction in the workplace. Men, even though we like to, you know, women, I guess, are known to be more social, but we're more social at home, right? But when it comes to the workplace, we're not very social. We're, we're, we're going to engage on work. And, you know, it's no nonsense. And we're here to do the work and we're here to do the work. And I think we've all talked about, and I'm sure you've talked about the aspect of um, the golf course, uh, the aspect of the board meetings that are not held in the boardroom. This is the indicator of affiliation, right? So you can see that men, again, are outpacing women when it comes to affiliation. Now, I'm not saying you need to go out every night and be drinking in the bars every night so you can have affiliation with your coworkers, but we need to be a little bit more smart and find the gendered way to be social in the workplace and not just about business. But I say that to say the next thing, um, men are also outpacing women when it comes to talking about business. 
right? Commerce, when it comes to commerce, when it comes to talking about data, when it comes to talking about professional uh, financial performance, we find that again, men are outpacing women in the workplace and the way they position themselves based on how they speak. Men are speaking commercial language. They're speaking numbers. Men tend also to be more scientific and analytical. They're seen and perceived. That's how they're showing up at work. That's how they're positioning themselves. They're positioning themselves to be more scientific and analytical. And when you add power, affiliation, commerce, and science to the narrative, then men tend to be seen as better leaders uh, for organizations, for our CEOs, at board chairpersons. And we really need to start thinking about these indicators when we think about how are we going to position ourselves better in the workplace. I don't know if there are any questions um, up until this point. Sharon, any questions, any comments? Sorry, everyone. I'm using a phone and my settings okay. keep hiding themselves. I think, Nuru, I have a question. I don't know sure. if I should ask it now. Or, okay. or, or, an observ or actually an observation, a quick one. Okay. Oh, yeah. You said that you said that uh, as women, we're afraid of showing up and being sincere in the workplace and that uh, we're not as social as men. And sometimes I wonder if as women, we're afraid to bring in our feminine power, the things that make us strong in our own space. I think sometimes we're afraid to show our vulnerability because it might be perceived as weakness. So we tend to want to compete like men, but we can't because we're not men. So I think yeah. we show up as inadequate. I don't know what you have to say about that. I think it's an interesting point. And it, it, it okay, sorry to jump in and kind of go back, but it goes back to this McKinsey finding, right? So how we have been trained about what the workplace is like is very much around the rule books around power. And I'm sure we've read, is it the 46 laws of power? And really just talking about that from a military perspective, right? Um, but what's happening in this era, when you look at Gen Z, when you look at your millennials and what they care about, we're talking about the current and future workforce. The current and future workforce is not about power place anymore. The current and future workplace is about sociability. It's about connections and it's about relationship building. So we also need to adjust our rule book and remember who we are as women because that's where the strength is, Sharon. Um, I think that's how I would respond to that. That's why you're seeing this sociability scale is an important one and interpersonal sensitivity, right? I'm not saying you need to show up and be crying at work, you know, um, but there are ways to show that you're sensitive and listening and really um, active listening skills. A lot of these inherent things that we know as women, right? Just being empathetic, um, being caring, just being participatory, convening, um, consulting. These are, these, are, these are attributes that we inherently have as women, but somehow when we leave and come to the office, we feel like you say, Sharon, that we need to be like men. And to me, I don't think that's an effective positioning strategy. Yeah. I agree. Do we have anybody yeah. in the room who would like to ask a question or can we proceed? Okay. I think we, I think we can proceed. Okay, cool. So yeah, so so this issue of power, affiliation, commerce, and science are really important when we think about how we're positioning ourselves. Um, now, when, when we were inviting you to attend this session, there was a survey that we sent and we asked you to fill it. Um, the genesis of that was uh, some time ago, we had Catherine Musakali, when I was working at Kenya Bankers Association, I'm not there anymore, but when I was working at the Kenya Bankers Association, uh, Rosalind Gino and myself had Catherine Musakali uh, give a talk and we did a survey. Um, so I'm attributing the data on the screen to both Kenya Bankers Association and Catherine Musakali. Um, so we wanted to understand what are the top self-sabotaging habits. Now, let me take a pause here because what I've shown you before is the first slide. Remember, I showed you about McKinsey, and this was a, a global study on what workers want. The next data points I shared with you was an assessment that was done by Career Connections in terms of how we are showing up in the office. This data point is now talking about how we see ourselves and how we see our deficiencies. And what we found when KBA and Catherine did this survey, and we looked at the 10 top self-sabotaging habits of women in finance, we found that 
and maybe you'll find that this also resonates with you. Um, we found that perfectionism was the number one self-sabotaging aspect. Number two was procrastination. Number three, fear of failure. Overworking and overstretching was another aspect Lack of self-appreciation, and again, it goes back to the comment that Sharon just kind of shared. Lack of self-appreciation and confidence, and then finally not having a, a personal development plan. So when we surveyed more than 100 women in finance, this were the top self-sabotaging um, uh, habits and behaviors. When we surveyed you as Women on Boards Network, it was almost a, a mirror image, right? It was, a, it was really, it paralleled completely. Um, but for you as women on boards, your number one self-sabotaging aspect was procrastination. So it kind of sounds like many of you know you have the potential to get to the next level. Many of you know you can get that board seat. But when it comes to setting that plan in place and start putting in the work, um, start positioning yourself to be seen and heard uh, in the right spaces, we find that maybe we're taking a little bit longer than we should to do it. And because of that, we might be missing some opportunities. The other area that came up for women on boards in terms of your self-sabotaging issues were, again, perfectionism and fear of failure. And to me, I think the two are they're, they're two sides of the same coin. Because if we feel we need to be perfect, um, but what's holding us back is we also feel like there's an issue of failure. So we always are trying to perfect the thing because we don't want to fail. So we're never removing, and sorry to bring a household domestic example, but we're, we're never removing the food from the kitchen and bringing it to the table, right? We are in the kitchen, changing up the spices, trying different oil and, you know, adjusting the heat on the stove. You know, we are like, oh, maybe let me add another side dish because this dish is not enough for my guests. You know what I mean? Just to use a domestic example, um, but the whole thing is we are suffering from analysis paralysis because of fear of failure. And because of that, we feel that we need to be perfect. Because of that, we either overdo things or we don't do things at all. And that was what was coming out from the data um, from women on boards. Also the aspect of confidence. And I think all those four aspects tie together. So in summary, this data that I've walked you through tells you a story. And what it's telling you is that, number one, we need to remember who we are as women. Remember this woman from Mercy. She doesn't need somebody to tell her who she is. She knows who she is and she knows where her power is. She knows what her role is for her family, for her community, and for the Omo region. So we need to, number one, not underestimate our womanhood. Think about what the leader of today and tomorrow is and the aspects that people are looking for and it's central to who we are as women being perceptive and empathetic matters in a multi-generational workplace and we are living in a multicultural multi-generational world the second thing that the data is telling us is what to be comfortable with right and why this is important to acknowledge and appreciate is because as you're trying to position yourself in places and within your work environment my sisters, you need to be comfortable with being powerful and be comfortable with power, be comfortable with leadership, be comfortable with being socially interactive and varying who you're interacting with in the social, in the workplace. Start using the language that the men are using. Start using commercial language, start using data and science. Technology is your friend. And finally, be comfortable with failure. I know you all I'm sure have talked about failing fast, let me tell you, that's why the word resilience is there and everyone is talking about resilience. It's, it's, resilience is a fancy word for failure, right? Just being comfortable, how, 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 <laughs> how elastic are you? Being comfortable with failure. The third thing that the data is telling us is women leaders need to be out there and it ties back into affiliation and social interaction. We need to get out there. We need to start positioning ourselves in spaces that will help us be seen and be heard. And then finally, we need to have a long-term plan we need to have a long-term actionable plan. And that kind of feeds into um, really why you're here today, because I think you're beginning to work on your plan and you're beginning to think about um, where you wanna be in the next few years. So I wanna now transition into the aspect of what makes you stand out. But before I get there, um, I'm assuming there are no hands up and I'm assuming there are no questions. 
I'm assuming we're comfortable with the data, which is this, which is really the foundation for what we're going to go through next. Uh, so Sharon, I'm going to keep moving until you stop me. Go on. Um, okay, great. So. Uh, Sharon had mentioned in the introduction, one of the, <laughs> the many things I do is Angaza Awards. And, and Angaza Awards um, is, 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 a, is a platform that I started um, to really help spotlight women in the financial sector in Africa um, who are doing some really important and impressive things, but perhaps they're not being seen and they're not being heard. So why I started Angaza Awards is I felt that it's important that we need to reframe what finance looks like in Africa, even the world. When you think about what a leader, a CEO of a financial institution is, and when you think about it globally, chances are you think of a white male. And even when you look at the data, it's white men. When you think about what a leader in the financial sector looks like in Africa, chances are you will either think of a black male, but if you're in South Africa, you will either think white male or, or black male. So it was so important for me because I would interact, whether it's in Kenya, Liberia, Ghana, Nigeria, um, Rwanda, Zambia, I would interact with so many powerful, amazing women that nobody knew, even their own markets didn't know. So I felt it's important we need to start reframing what finance looks like for Africa and globally. I also felt it was important that these women who are doing amazing work need to remember how powerful they are. Again, just embrace your power and the space that you're in. So uh, we needed to remind these women uh, who they are, right? The other thing I wanted to look at was how do we spotlight these women who are doing amazing work and no one is talking about them? Um, because perhaps maybe they're those darlings and favorites that we like to talk about, you know, and, you know, we don't take the time to new names. Um, and then finally, uh, I felt it was important that we start building um, a system, an ecosystem, where women who are emerging and needing to start pulling other women along um, and, and really looking at younger women and encouraging more women to come into finance, but grooming them to remember their womanhood because a woman in finance is a woman who cares not only about financial performance, she also cares about society and helping women in business. She cares about the environment. She cares about governance. She cares about values. Last week, um, Old Mutual is one of my sponsors for Angaza. And uh, we do a coffee session and we have, we invite women to come and talk, uh, women CEOs and the Angaza women to talk. And one of the Old Mutual leaders, who's the CEO of Old Mutual in Rwanda, um, she said that her values are her number one thing and she will walk away from a job based on her values. Now, this is something we need to groom the next generation of women in finance because we do not want to have a generation of women in finance who don't care about values, who don't care about society or the environment, right? So it's important that we start grooming the next generation of women in finance to pay attention to, you know, the role and duty that they have in society. I always love Lina Higoro. Um, she's the CEO of NCBA in Rwanda, she was one of the Angaza winners. And Lena, before we spotlighted her on, in Angaza, can you imagine one of the journalists in Rwanda said they didn't even know she was the CEO of the bank, as in, as if there's so many women CEOs in Africa who are heading banks, right? So, so you realize that sometimes you really need to Angaza some people. So I wanna show you what the judges of Angaza Awards were looking for. And the reason why I want to show you what the judges were looking for is because remember we said at the beginning, we want to think about what we are saying and what people are hearing, because that is so important when you're positioning yourself. You need to be aware and alive to what signals you're putting out, what information you're putting out, and what people are receiving. So I'm going to walk you through um, two data points uh, from Angaza Awards, and it's going to help you start thinking about yourself and your narrative and your story and what you're putting out there and what other people are hearing. Uh, Catherine Musakali is one of our judges and um, we have a wonderful panel of judges that I'm so thankful for uh, that really have supported the process. So one of the things the Angaza judges 
were looking at when we looked at all these amazing women, every woman that applies is fantastic. But when you go through their story, when you go through what they're saying about themselves, the majority of the women, if you look at the x-axis, the last bar, they had no data. The majority of the women had no data. They were talking about themselves in a narrative and qualitative way, but they were not talking about themselves in a quantitative way. And that's what kicked out a lot of the applicants. And I imagine that's the same when you're applying for a board position. That's the same when you're applying for a job. That's the same when you're speaking out in public. If you're not using data, remember, we're going back to um, those indicators, this issue of commerce, okay, and science. Um, are we communicating in that language? The other thing that the judges felt was a lot of the applicants were not clearly articulating why they are special. What is it about them that is impressive? And how can we attribute what you're saying to the firm performance? We can say that we've done a lot. And even I'm sure all of us, when we look at our resumes, we see we have done a lot. But can you attribute to the data point what you have done and how it has helped move a product, move a company, move a country along, move an industry along? Are you able to quantify that? A lot of women were very low on clarity and low on attribution when they were speaking about themselves. And it's something we need to think about when we're positioning ourselves. The other thing um, we found was a lot of women were not really strong on leadership in terms of showing leadership. And then you might ask, okay, Nuru, what does leadership look like? What do you mean? We mean that, are you in spaces that are beyond your institution? Right. So if you are a CFO of a brewery, OK, if you're a CFO of a brewery, for example, and you're talking about what it is you do, is the only thing you do and the only area of influence and power you have is that brewery alone? Or is it the industry? Is it the private sector? Is it Kenya? Is it East Africa? What is what is your scope of leadership? What is your what what is what is your scope of leadership, really? So we found that. When it comes to leadership, people are attributing leadership to their title, and that's not leadership. Your title will come and go, my sisters. So where, where are you as a leader, right? The institution you're working with today might not be the place you're gonna be in a week's time, in a month's time, in a year's time, right? So being a leader goes beyond that title and that seat you're sitting on. And we found that a lot of women um, were not coming out strongly on leadership in that regard. And finally, we found two interesting sides of the same coin, the type of information. Some of the women were really talking about old, old accomplishments, things that they accomplished 10, 20 years ago. Um, and there was a view that you need to have a current narrative. Yes, there are those landmark things that you've done that you should highlight and speak to. But that should not only be your story. You need to also speak to current information. So we found that a lot of women were just going backwards into the archive, right? But when it comes to what's current, um, it was a bit light. By the same token, there were another set of applicants who just had new information only, right? They had just started an organization. They'd only been there three years. Um, and they're talking about uh, and attributing some of the work that we felt that, well, this must have taken longer to, to, to be realized, right? So you're talking about something that maybe took 10, 20, 10 years to realize, but you've only been there for a few months. So you cannot attribute that to yourself, right? Entirely. So there was this view of the balance between old information and new information and knowing what to pull out. So these were some of the things that I felt is important when it comes to positioning that we can share from an Angasa perspective. Now, in terms of, so that was what judges were critiquing. So in terms of what judges were rewarding, it's another story about positioning. And it goes back to leadership. Um, the top bar there within the pink square is around regional scope and um, uh, attribution to firm performance. So people respond to women who are present in multiple jurisdictions, locations, and regions. And they feel that that is, um, is leadership and power. So it's important that we start thinking beyond our county, our country. Um, 
I always say that Kenya is a very small country. Uh, Tanzania, Rwanda, our individual countries are very small, but Africa is big, right? Um, so we need to start thinking as Africans. Can we just stop this whole thing of one country and thinking that our country is enough? We need to start positioning ourselves as Africans. We need to start positioning our abilities as Pan-African abilities and our scope and reach as Pan-African. The other thing that judges responded well to was a well-written profile, the story, the storytelling, the narrative. And um, there were two applications that came out so wonderfully. One was by a CFO who told a fantastic story that shocked me a CFO would tell such a wonderful story, but backed with numbers. So really that profile that you put out makes a difference. So take time to work on your profile. And then finally, social impact. Social impact um, might sound like a soft thing, but remember what I was saying, power of, of women is really around who we are. And we are social people and we care about society. We care about our communities. So um, that was an important uh, aspect as well. And it is the future. I was attending um, a session yesterday uh, that Elon Musk was hosting, talking about um, the decentralized monetary system and people were asking him, why did you invest in Bitcoin? And he was like really just talking about how it's going to save the world through social decentralized finance. And what I came away from this is all these billionaires, Bill Gates, you know, um, Elon Musk and all these guys, Richard Branson, they're trying to save the world. They're, they're flying a social flag. This issue of social impact is the future. Um, it is going to be an indicator of how firms are measured. So we need to start building our ability within that space. Um, I'm gonna start moving a bit quicker because I see I only have a few minutes left. Um, when it came to verbatim feedback, it just kind of reinforces uh, the data I shared. Really this aspect of being more precise uh, and, and, and particular when it comes to talking about our story. I wanna share this one case study uh, before I transition on. Um, this was one lady and I, very sad. This was one lady who um, supervises a small group of people, but her asset base was big. So perhaps she's in the in technology space. And you know, technology space, um, it's, it's low on labor, but high on human resources, right? So it's low on manpower, but high on capacity, right? So she doesn't need many employees to manage. So she doesn't need to say, I manage 5,000 people, right? Uh, she can do the same with five people. So she has a big asset base. She was very solid on the social aspect and ESG and ethics. However, she was too inward looking on her firm. And I think this is the thing with a lot of us ladies. We strive to perform and outperform within an institution and we don't stretch ourselves to our industry. And we need to be positioning ourselves a little bit more when it comes to um, industry. So putting it all together, um, I wanna say that a lot of you um, based on the feedback that you gave on your survey when you're applying to, sorry, when you're RSVPing to enter this uh, session, um, we asked you how far in advance do you think about your career positioning? And what came out was um, the majority of you really, you look at um, maybe two to four years. Uh, the majority of you look two to four years. And um, I feel that that's too short of a horizon when you're thinking about positioning, because a lot of times where you wanna go, um, it'll take a little bit longer when it comes to really positioning and positioning yourself as a leader um, in that space. So I want us to start thinking a little bit longer in terms of our horizon, but what you can do today, please start thinking about the language you're using, being commercially uh, and scientific in your language. Think about how you're socializing in the workplace, the issue of affiliation. Um, and think about your womanhood, think about how you're showing up um, in the office. So the three areas of improvement that I would say is, it's important as we're planning ourselves and thinking about how we are positioning ourselves, remembering the Angaza feedback. Um, we felt that it's so important that you're clearly articulating your story. You need to tell a visual story and how you color in into the lines is with your data. Right? That's how you color your story. Take time to think about it. Um, 
we always tell the women, take time to think about your entry. Um, think about your accomplishments in an inverted pyramid. So inverted pyramid is basically tell people the most important things first, and then you narrow down to what's not so important, like an upside down pyramid. Um, number two, data. I can't overstate it, the fact that we need to start using data. And finally, it's important that women, when they're positioning themselves, you need to be multifunctional multifaceted the world is um, is completely different now um so we are dealing with so many different cultures in the workplace so many different lifestyles in the workplace um and we need to and we and because of globalization the world is seamless now right so we're dealing with different different dynamics at the country level um dealing with engendered issues. Uh, so it's important that we are flexible in that regard. Um, so, but within that, uh, there's a lot of risk, right? So we need to remember what we said, be comfortable with failure. So we need to be comfortable that we're not gonna get things right. We should not be perfectionists. Remember how high we were on perfectionism and procrastination? Let's get comfortable with taking on more risk. Put your hand up for those assignments pack up your bag and move to another country if you need to create a new space for yourself and re reinvent yourself. Take that risk. It's going to be high risk, high return. Um, think about your geographic scope. Um, again, Africa is big, but our countries are small. Let's stop thinking ourselves as we are in this country. We are Africans. Um, and let's just kind of expand ourselves through reading, through collaborating, volunteering. I went back to school, for example, um, go back to school, so many free resources. At this point, I want to pause and ask you to do a little bit of work. Um, and I want you to think about who you are um, without your title and without your organization. And I'll tell you why. Uh, and, and, and this is also an exercise that I have recently gone through. So um, I, I, I had worked at the Kenya Bankers Association for 10 years at the director level. And uh, I resigned in December uh, because I wanted to pursue graduate studies, but more so I wanted to support my daughter to finish high school. Um, and, and I stepped down. And it was such a bittersweet, right? Because I knew I was doing it for the right reasons. Um, but what I was worried and scared about was, um, will I matter without the KBA tag, right? I, it had been who I was for 10 years, um, but I thought that's who I was, right? And what I didn't realize is, um, over the years, as I was really focused on the sustainable finance agenda, and I've been working in sustainable finance space for even before I joined KBA and really advocating for this on the continent, I didn't realize all those breadcrumbs, all those data points that I was laying um, actually laid were part of the building, the blocks that laid the foundation for the who I was and the what I was about. Um, and, and the epiphany happened for me during Women's Month. Uh, this year, um, the IFC International Finance Corporation reached out to me and said, you know, Nuru, we're showcasing people around the world and we want to showcase you as a woman in finance um, because of the work you've done in sustainable finance. And I was like, oh, wow, what an honor. But I was like, gosh, I'm no longer working at KBA. I'm no longer a director. I'm no longer heading the Green Board program. So maybe you need to uh, check with somebody else. And they're like, oh, you're no longer at KBA. I said, yeah, I'm no longer there. So they're like, okay, we'll come back to you. These people came back, and this is uh, the IFC team in Kenya and Washington. They came back and they said, we don't care that you're no longer at KBA. We want a spot like you. And I cried because I thought who I was was my title. I thought without KBA, no one in banking would want to speak to me. But that was not the case right because i had built that track record remember the slide this positioning masterclass is about being sincere being intentional and being consistent i have been consistent on sustainable finance work for over 10 years and people have seen it and i've done it in spaces that people have been and seen so they appreciated me as the human as the human being as the individual versus the title and the organization so I want you to take a minute and think about who you are. Forget about the title. Forget about the title in the organization, who you are. And is that what you want to be seen and known for for the next 10 years? 
Um, remember, you all are thinking two to four years. That's your horizon. But I want to challenge you to stretch it further. For the next 10 to 20 years, who are you and what do you want to be doing? Where do you want to be seen? So I'm going to give you 20 seconds. I'm going to pause. I want you to think about that and then we'll continue. And I don't know if anyone wants to share. Um, Sharon, are there any comments or is anybody yeah. asking? Yes, Nuru, we have some questions. Can I throw them at your way yeah. as people are thinking? Yeah. Okay. One question we had was, where did I write my question? Look at me. Okay. Tips on how an introvert can show up in a male dominated environment was okay. one question. And would you like to answer that before I give you the second? Sure, just keep going. Okay. And the second was, could you explore the environment women have to navigate to get recognition, which really ties in with what you've just said about yeah. showing up and showing out. The environment, women? How women can navigate to, yeah. um, to explore the environment, how they can navigate to get recognition. Uh, okay, I, okay, okay. In, I think it yeah. ties in with that male dominated environment. I think the two questions are related. Yeah, yeah, okay. So, so, <laughs> Surprisingly, I am an introvert and my, you know, it's good Sharon you're here because you're my sister and you can bear with me witness. I am a very personal person. I am a very, I'm an introvert. However, uh, I actually, I don't like people looking at me. That's just kind of who I am. Um, so I am naturally an introvert. However, I recognize that if I have decided to be a leader in a space, you cannot be a leader in the back of the room in the corner. Right. So and you cannot be a leader just in your head. So you realize that even us introverts, we need to start training ourselves and building that confidence. And that confidence comes with practice. Right. So the first time you present, maybe you're not like speak out in public or whatever, take a public speaking opportunity uh, inter get an interview on the media and whatever. The first time. Yeah. OK. Yeah. You're going to make a mistake. But guess what? You fail fast and you get back on that horse. Um, and that's really been how I have, uh, Sharon, that's how, that's how I've addressed my preference to be an introvert. Um, so it's really just, just having the courage to put yourself out there and know that you've earned the right to be wherever you are. The space you occupy, you've earned that right. So you really just have to, have to just kind of close your eyes and just get it done. I think that's how I would answer that. Um, in terms of how to navigate for recognition, I think it depends on what you're talking about. Um, so some of the things that I've always done over the course of my career, even when I was 19 years old, working in a, in a, in a predominantly white uh, company, was uh, I, 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 I was purposeful in how I used data to present what I have done. And I was purposeful in making sure that you will recognize what I have accomplished. And I'll put it in my performance review with data. I'll say I was able to generate X amount in sales. I was able to build X by Y um, by actually putting data points um, and 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 just over the course of my career, in fact, when, <laughs> when I was um, leaving KBA, Habil Olaka was like, Nuru, you know, when you do your performance review, you come with the, you come with the story and the data to back you up. And, and that's how, that's one of the ways you get recognition, right? No one will tell your story for you. You need to know and start documenting your, your, your achievements. No one's going to do that for you. So, you, it starts with you in terms of getting recognition. You need to document it and get it out there. Um, start taking women in leadership, start taking uh, speaking opportunities. Um, I have a lot of friends who are journalists who always complain to me that women don't show up for interviews. I complain to them that they call us last minute. But guess what? You know what? When they call you last minute, you better show up anyway, because that's how you start getting your data out there. That's how you start getting recognition. So start being seen, um, speaking opportunities and things like this, being active on your social media. Um, and we're going to talk about that in a few minutes. Um, so that's how I'd answer that. Um, uh, I hope that's helpful. I think uh, there are other strategies like getting uh, people to speak on your behalf, right? So in those spaces where you're not there, um, people will speak on your behalf. But remember, they need to have the data to be able to speak on your behalf. So I think that's um, probably some of the things. Um, and I can, I can side chat um, on that as well. 
um, so we can move on. Hopefully that was helpful. No, no. Um, mm -hmm. Can I add something from the chat that sure. I really liked uh, that Rosemary Homer shared? She said also as women, we tend to be, um, we like to share our accomplishments. We developed, we did this, we did that, the team and I. If you are the one who has actually done it, you need to step up and take the accolades and take the recognition. We're so afraid of the spotlight. That was shared by Rosemary Wahome. Yeah, Rosemary, I agree. And it goes back to the slide I was showing you uh, with Angaza Awards, the issue of attribution. A lot of the applicants got kicked out because they did not attribute the firm's success to them. They used a lot of we, 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 we. And judges were like, no, what did you do, right? So it's important that you also cleverly, strategically, ensure you are taking on assignments where you are the leader. So you can say, I did this. Don't be the one who is always part of a team. Yeah, be part of the team, but you need to be ahead. You need to be driving that bus, right? So you need to purposefully design your assignments, your work, where at least every year you have one or two strategic things that is you and nobody else can question whether or not it was you who delivered on X, Y, Z. The other thing um, I want you all to think about is what is that one knowledge area people identify with you most? And I'll tell you why this is so important because everybody now is an expert of everything, right? So it's so important that we start understanding what is our comparative advantage? What is that one thing we do better than anybody else? What is that one thing we know more than? We have more experience than anybody else, right? That's your comparative advantage. So. What is that one knowledge area people identify with you most? If you don't have an answer, that's fine. That's why you start planning, right? So if you already have an answer, you're like, Nuru, my comparative advantage area is nobody can sell, you know, nobody can sell uh, horticulture better than me in Africa, okay? So, so maybe you're further along than somebody else who's like, you know what, I don't even know. I know I do many things well, but I don't know what's that one thing. Um, so we need to think about that. What is that one thing we do better than anybody else, more efficiently, more intelligently, more knowledgeably than anybody else? And that to me is now where you start thinking about your positioning um, and, and building your narrative. And also, it's not just about what you can do great, but why should people care? Right. So so if you really want to have influence, you really need to be in those spaces that people care about either now or in the future. So start thinking about that. Um, and and also the final thing to think about is the timing, the when. OK, so when do I start really engaging on this area that I am having a comparative advantage on? Um, so I want you to start thinking about this um, after this session. I know it's been a long day, ladies, but I, I know this is like drinking water from a fire hose. Um, but these are just some of the things you need to start thinking about when you're positioning yourself. Um, within that, uh, I want to touch on, and I'm glad that Sharon is, is moderating the session, uh, because I also want to touch on your visual identity. When you were re uh, registering to attend this event, we asked you, do you have a professional photo and do you have a professionally written biography? Um, and the majority of you said no. Um, so I want to encourage us. Um, we need to get professionally taken photos. 80% um, of the information people retain is based on what they see. So positioning is not just about the narrative and the data. It's also about how you're presenting yourself, right? How you're showing up. Um, 20% is what people read and 10% is what people hear. So your digital identity is actually very essential to how you position yourself. And I don't know, Sharon, do you have any comment here? Uh, since your one of your many businesses is around photography and image and the, the image aspect. I don't know if you want to touch on that. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, and this is something that came to me quite late in life, ladies. I, I came across um, a YouTube um, podcast. I can't remember what it was, but the message resonated so deeply with me. It said, every time you step out of your door, imagine that you're about to step out on a set and you're the news host or an anchor and everyone can see you. Meaning when you go to the mall, when you go to the club, you know, the, the golf club or, you know, your networking sessions or you're even going to buy milk in the grocery store. The way you look matters because you never know who you're going to meet 
or who might you know, see you without you seeing them. So your image is just not what you look like in the office. It's literally every time you step outside the door. And like Nuru said, also when your image is being seen on LinkedIn or on Facebook, whatever you share, even on Facebook, even your personal life is being seen. So you need to also really moderate that. Don't overshare. And your image is extremely important, physical or digital. Absolutely. In fact, you're reminding me, Sharon, you're talking about when you step out of the house, you're stepping onto a stage. There's a lady, <laughs> there's a lady who um, uh, at one of the clubs, she swims with full makeup on. There you go. Right. And I remember I asked her, why do you swim with full makeup on? And she was like, why not? I want to look beautiful. I want, I like how I look. <laughs> now, but like, okay, okay. Um, so, so, <laughs> she wants to look good wherever she is including in the water all right so 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 really just thinking about how you you show up right and where you're showing up because again you just never know you a ceo who is looking to recruit a new board member could be in the next swimming lane right so she wants to look ready right picture ready so mm -hmm. i'm not talking about being superficial i'm not talking about looking for ig moments and things like this i'm talking about how you present yourself um and the visual is so important um, when I was doing this masterclass, um, I had invited two speakers. One was Christopher Dongo, and Chris is actually the person who introduced me to Twitter <laughs> um, uh, 10 years ago. And Chris is just an expert in digital positioning, and I asked him to really help me think through this aspect of digital positioning. Um, and Chris really shared some really wonderful tips I want to share with you as I'm closing this presentation. So Chris really talked about the importance of your digital identity. Um, and like Sharon said, you need to know uh, where your digital identity is showing up online. You need to protect that. Your pictures, don't just be posting all sorts of pictures about yourself. Oh, I've had a bad hair day, click and post on social media. Why are you sharing this information? So you need to think about that. Um, also on your Facebook, as much as you have your friends and family on Facebook and you have your LinkedIn is separate, but the digital identities is one, right? So think about what pictures you're putting on social media, including just within your family circles. Um, the other uh, tip that Chris had was thinking about this aspect of the second screen. I don't know, maybe by a show of hands, um, if you can use your reaction, you can tell me if you know about the second screen aspect. I don't know, Sharon, have you ever heard of second screen? No, this is news to me. Okay. so. We live in a world where everyone is like this. You can see this picture on your or left. You have somebody like this, right? The second screen is basically the fact that people don't only process information linearly, right? So right now you're probably Googling me. Who is this Nuru and why does she have to talk to us, right? Or you're like, who's Sharon Michina, right? Or you're probably on LinkedIn uh, sending an invitation to somebody. Or you're on Twitter, right? But at the same time, you're on this screen. The second screen is uh, a phenomenon and it's, it's, it's really how we are as human beings now. We never take information based on the first screen. We take information based on many different screens. What we see on TV, what we're seeing on our phone, what we're seeing on the laptop. And that is why it's important you think through your positioning, you think through your messaging, your story, where you are and how you're showing up because people will Google and find you in many different places at the same time you're speaking to them in a conference, right? So that's the second screen. People use different screens to process the information that's in front of them. Um, so really, they, they do this for many reasons. One, they want to either connect, they want to enhance what you're talking about, they want to verify what you're talking about. Um, so people are just processing information a lot at the same time. And it's something to think about uh, as you're positioning. And then finally, uh, Chris always says, always look for knowledge sharing opportunities because there is a gap for knowledge. Um, so he had a tip, go to Google, apparently with Google Analytics, not apparently, it's the fact. When you go to Google Analytics, it tells you what people are Googling. I'm sure we've seen those articles that, oh, the most Googled word today was Will Smith slaps Chris Rock, right? You know, or, you know, so Google has analytics about what people are searching for. And Chris says that's one of the indicators of the information that's there. But at the same time, it's an indication of the information that's not there. Right. So when you're looking at positioning yourself, you either want to reinforce with new insight 
what's out there or you want to bring new information. So it's two different strategies that you can look at. So Google Analytics, Chris says, is a good way to start thinking about that. I hope that was helpful when you think about your digital identity. I'm about to wrap up. The final thing I want to talk on is storytelling. Again, positioning is also about storytelling. And with this, I spoke to an old family friend called Rashid. Um, Rashid was one of the editorial directors at Nation Media Group uh, before the coup uh, in Kenya. And he's been writing stories for over 33 years. So I asked Rashid to help me think through what makes somebody a good storyteller and what is good about a story? What makes a good story? And I had asked him, I said, Rashid, give me three tips to make a good story. And he said, Nuru, there are no three tips. There's only one tip. There's only one tip in how to tell a good story. And what Rashid said is you have to be authentic. And I know we talk about this word authentic a lot. Um, uh, so basically it's about being sincere, right? Be telling your own story. And Rashid was like, try to start telling your own story. Don't tell other people's stories, start telling your own stories. And then I said, okay, then how do you tell a better story? And he said, you need to start journaling. Now, I think a lot of us journal, but we journal for our maybe mental health or we journal because you're doing your Bible study. So you're journaling for that. Very few of us journal for our career and for our positioning. And what Rashid is saying is start having a book by your bedside table um, in your office. And whenever you experience something, you meet an interesting person, start taking, start journaling those experiences. And over time, those ex experiences become your story. So the next time you're speaking and you're looking for an example of a nice story to tell, um, to start your conversation, uh, you will have, you'll have an archive of your own personal stories and your own insights that you can use to share um, either to your staff, your board, in the industry, wherever it is. And what Rashid says is your story is like um, butterflies, right? So you get brief moments of insight. You get brief moments of epiphanies. And if you're not journaling and catching those butterflies um, when they come, you're going to forget them and you'll be like, what was that time? Or give me an, you know, you know. So he was like, just make sure that as you're building up your ability to tell powerful stories, let them be your own stories and start journaling to help you tell better stories. And then finally, what Rashid was saying is that um, he wanted to encourage women when you talk about, when you're talking and telling, sharing information is basically storytelling, right? So when you're telling anybody information about yourself and what you've accomplished, um, Rashid says, you should always think about what's in it for them first. Don't tell people what you've accomplished just to tell people what you've accomplished, right? People are self-interested. Everybody is self-interested. So there's the what's in it for me before they really appreciate who you are. So he says, always think about when you're framing your story, what's in it for the audience before what you're trying to get out. Um, and then second, he says, you always think about why you're interesting and why you're different and, and really thinking about that. Um, and he says, you need to always sell yourself, always be selling yourself. If something doesn't sell you on your bio profile or on your resume, he says, stop wasting space, <laughs> just cut it out. Um, and then finally, he said, the best stories are always rewritten. And again, as you're positioning yourself, you're, it's, it's an iterative process, you're always, rewriting and re repositioning yourself. You don't position yourself once and forever, right? So it's always about rewriting. So in summary, ladies, I'm done. I wanted to say, I know this is a man opening a fire hose, right? So you are on the other side of that fire hose because I've covered a lot of information uh, very quickly. Um, and I hope within this presentation, you've picked up a few nuggets that are helpful for you. But to help you really summarize everything I've talked about, it's three words. Even though Rashid didn't want to give me three words, I'm giving you three words. One is be sincere, be authentic, and, and, and remember who you are. Remember the Mercy woman from Omo Valley. You have many layers. You have a lot of capacities and capabilities. So be sincere to that. Let that show up in the office. Be intentional. Be intentional in the language, commercial language that you're using, scientific language. Be intentional in how you build relationships and socialize. And finally, be consistent. Understand your what, this comparative advantage that you have, and be consistent about it. You might be ahead of the market. The market will catch up to you, but just be consistent. 
So finally, in closing, I want to say that um, really my Angaza process has really showed me that women are so powerful, but sometimes we forget our power. So I want to encourage you, Leila Dela said this, um, um, one of these quotes that, you know, you need to remember who you are. So I, I really want to encourage you to remember who you are, because once you remember who you are, you're going to change the game. Uh, I'd like to pass it back to Sharon. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Nuru. That was amazing. That was a lot of information. You're right. Um, yeah. I trust that WBN will be able to share this presentation for our digestion. There was one last question from the chat group. I'd like to have you consider, how can I discover who I should be? Ooh. Mm. I don't know, yeah. do people have recommendations on the chat? Um, how do you just, does the person want to unmute and, and maybe, so let's talk, let's talk, let's talk. What do you mean, how do you discover? Um, um, this how do you sent uh, through a private DM, so I can't even oh. tell who the person is. Okay. How do you discover who, say it again? How can I discover who I should be? Yeah. I think um, there are different ways. I think we all know our talents. Uh, some of them are we know, uh, other talents people tell us. So I think it's important to consult and talk to people if you're not sure what your, what your strength is. Um, some of us get feedback during our performance reviews. Others get feedback from friends, from family. You might get feedback from social media, right? You just look at your social media. If you post something and people are like, wow, that's really interesting. That will tell you that you have information that people want. Um, um, I think the aspect that uh, um, Rashid is talking about, the journaling, I think can also help you see what you're really interested in. Um, so I think there are many ways to do that. Um, also doing personality assessments, I think are helpful because it will also help you understand what are your motivations, right? So I think uh, doing uh, coaching, like executive coaching, getting an executive coach can also help you um, uncover that. I think, I don't know if there's anybody else who has recommendations for our sister um, who's asking that question. Um, uh, actually, I, I was thinking. Oh, yeah. sorry. Go on. Who else has something to yeah. say, please? Yeah, Cecilia said probably through exploring your interests. Yeah, so I agree with Cecilia. Really, it's just it's an and and, and that's why I was saying it's it, it's a process, right? So you might um, think you're interested and passionate about something, and then it dovetails to something else. And I think that's also fine because remember, like we're saying, as women, we're multifaceted and we're dynamic, yeah, and we respond to our environment. Um, yeah. Okay, I see Catherine. Hi, Catherine. I see Catherine saying try Johari's window self awareness. Mm -hmm. I also like what someone said that uh, something you do without too much struggle. And again, Nuru, what you said about comparative advantage, what you actually do better than everybody else. And I think you know it. I think you know it. I think you know what you do better than everything else, but everyone else, but you're maybe being too shy about it. Um, I see Caroline saying uh, psychometric testing. Thank you for that. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Okay. Uh, can people start now to raise their hands if they have specific questions they would like to ask Nuru, please? Thank you, Evelyn, for your feedback. <laughs> welcome to W. Uh, yeah, welcome to WBN. <laughs> Thank you, Catherine. Okay. Okay, okay Nuru. Back to you, Sha. Thank you. Yes, it doesn't look like we have too many questions. Um, I just want to highlight what struck me, and then I would love to pass this along now to our chair, Kathleen Musakali, to give a few closing remarks, and then I'll update us on what our coming, upcoming events are. What caught me the best, I loved it, was what makes you special, and how, how can you affect change, and can you quantify this in terms of uh, positioning yourself? Uh, be sincere and be authentic, especially in telling your own story, and um, I would actually advise all of us to print that picture of that Musi woman to remind us who we are, what our voice is, what we have to add to the, to, the, to the story that is a human story. We all have a part to play and we should not be afraid to play our part because if we don't play our part, I don't wanna even say someone else will play your part because we're all unique and individual. It just means that part gets unplayed and we all get to lose from it. So that's my whole takeaway from how to position yourself. And it's also very important to remember how you look physically when you step out, when you meet people like Nuru said, 
of how people receive you is based on just how you look. And be careful about our digital footprint and our profiles in the, in the digital sphere. Don't overshare and be professional in everything that you do. That's what I got out of it. Over to you, Catherine, please. Any words for us? Oh my goodness, these sisters, these sisters. <laughs> I will tell you what, when we requested um, Sharon to uh, moderate this session, we didn't know Sharon is Nuru's sister. So, I mean, it has been such a wonderful session. I'm so sorry I got in a little late. I was battling Kampala traffic, but I finally got in. My goodness, Nuru, gosh, I, I just don't know what to say. Ladies, I think you have had so so much today you have a lot to work mm -hmm. on to reflect on to think through and then to ask yourself what next what next each and every one of us has to take away something out of this session there is no point in coming to webinars and then you're the same one who attended this webinar yesterday you know you are the same person who you were yesterday. I think there's so much to learn from Nuru. Nuru, we cannot thank you enough. <laughs> and when we do come back to ask you to come and speak to us again, please, please accept. Because I think you're one person that we can spend a week listening to mm -hmm. and just challenging ourselves about who we ought, who we are, who we ought to be, what else we need to do to get to where we want to go. So thank you so much. I cannot, cannot thank you enough. And I think one other thing that I want to say about Nuru. Nuru, when I first met you, you were still at Barclays then. It was, it was Barclays before it became uh, Absa. And, and one thing that I've learned about you over time is what you do, you really do to the best of your, your ability. Because when you were at Barclays, you were just Barclays, you were Barclays, you know, when you went to KBA, you were just KBA, you know, so whatever chances you get, ladies, just put in your best, put in your very best and just, you know, step out, put, put your best foot forward. I really thank you for giving us that example and also spotlighting women, you know, the women in the finance field in particular. I think that is the one field that uh, had almost been forgotten. The women were doing so much in that field and we had almost forgotten them. Thank you for being their voice. Thank you for being their face. Thank you for spotlighting them. Ladies, I just want to thank you for attending um, the session today. Um, the, the, the ideas you have shared on the chat, the questions you have asked have actually made the session what it was today. Sharon, excellent moderation. Thank, oh, thank you, you. <laughs> so, so much. And, 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 and Sharon keeps telling us on the wall, take your pictures, your professional pictures. Yeah. Now you can relate mm -hmm. to what Sharon has been talking mm -hmm. about. So please, when you do send us um, your profiles, when we ask for your profiles, I'm going to start rejecting um, <laughs> profiles without a good professionally taken picture, photo. So please- Especially Catherine, I don't want to interrupt, but especially your LinkedIn, I see some people with their kids' photos on LinkedIn. Mm. <laughs> That's for Facebook, not LinkedIn. But yeah, professional photos for, for, for uh, LinkedIn, please. Thank you. <laughs> yes, thank you. Thank you for making that point. And, and, and just that whole issue around what you post on social media. So, if you're just posting about, you know, photos about you on the beach, you um, at a friend's party, you, that's what we associate you with. So when mm -hmm. we are looking for a board member, we are not going to, you know, that's where we're going to, we're going to put you in a box to say this person is not serious from a professional perspective. This is what she loves to do. We're not saying it's bad to do that, but that's how we are going to box you. Mm -hmm. Ladies at Women on Boards Network, we are honored to have you tonight. We uh, appreciate the feedback you're giving us in terms of just um, um, making us better at what we are doing. We appreciate the feedback you keep sending to the Secretariat. We appreciate the fact that you 
um, attend our, our, our forums, our various forums, and we look forward to continuing to engage with you. There are many other programs that we have lined up uh, this year. Um, we are just going through um, the um, corporate governance um, uh, training this week. And, and Nuru, I want to formally invite you to the graduation of that uh, uh, corporate governance class. I will send you the details and, and, and I'm hoping that you'll be able to join so that you can inspire the ladies uh, even more. Thank you. And let me hand back to the secretariat. Okay, thank you so much for that, Catherine. Again, thank you, Nuru, so much. Everything was so insightful. I don't think we had enough time to digest everything. Um, we want to encourage the ladies come up with a positioning statement about yourself. Do not define yourself by your job and create that personal development plan and make it long-term and make yourself accountable to it. Now for the WRBN upcoming events on 11th June, there's a breakfast and round table events. I, I believe that will be shared in our WhatsApp group. 16th June, the group board mentoring program and lastly, just to remind you, the Global Women on Board Network registration is still ongoing. And it's going to be uh, from 2nd June to 11th November. So remember that, ladies. And I thank you so much for this opportunity, Catherine, for allowing me to moderate. This is actually my first time to moderate, and I loved it. So thank you for that. <laughs> Cheers. Thank you, ladies. Have a great evening. Thank you, everyone. Let we are all free to leave at our leisure now. Thank you. Thank you. God Have bless. a good night. God bless. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.